day, hundreds of people drive down East Philadelphia Street in Boyertown. People going about their business, many unaware of the historic drama that unfolded here back in 1908. January 13th of that year, Boyertown residents came here to the Rhodes Opera House to watch a play. Little did they know they would play a starring role in a historic drama by night's end. 170 people would die in a fire, along with a fireman rushing to help. Their deaths would be a catalyst for stricter fire safety laws that are still in place today. This special presentation honors the lives that were lost and the legacy of the tragedy. It was a tragedy that tore families apart. Moyer, Anderson, Tiger, and devastated a town. The screams could be heard for miles and continue to echo through the streets of modern day Boyertown. It was a tragedy that killed 170 people. Since the bodies were so terribly burned, most of them could not be identified. The death toll shocked the nation and paved the way for fire safety laws still in place a century after the flames at the Rhodes Opera House went out. Who was to blame? That was terrible. And how did this disaster affect millions of lives? The Rhodes Opera House fire, the legacy of a tragedy. In 1907, Boyertown, Pennsylvania was a snapshot of our nation's progressive era. What started as a tiny crossroad had grown into a booming economy. Newly paved streets lined the way for thriving industry. It was a market town. People came in on Saturday to go shopping, to um, talk with each other, to go to uh, the hotel to have oysters. Two cigar factories and one of the nation's largest casket companies kept money flowing into the pockets of its 2,000 residents. It gave women a chance to work for the first time, you know, and earn money. And so there were dress shops, there were hat shops, uh, there were jewelry shops where these young women could spend their money. Indeed, Boyertown had everything Victorian families needed. Discerning mothers could buy cakes and bread from competing bakeries and meet for their tables at local butcher shops. Pint-sized patrons pressed their faces against confectionery store windows, and the town's fathers conducted business at local banks. Many rented horse-drawn carriages to carry lumber and furniture. There was even talk in church pews of building another school to handle the borough's growth. It was a life reminiscent of a Mark Twain novel. Children spent their free time whiling the hours away, rod in hand, while their parents raised a glass to the future. At the close of the year, Berks County Democrat editor Charles Spots captured the borough's good fortune. The death rate was small and the birth rate large. No epidemic visited us and none of our people met with any serious misfortune for all of which we are duly thankful and proud. But the editor's words would soon prove to be a dark irony, one so terrible it couldn't have been fathomed by those on whom it would befall. The Rhodes Opera House fire, the legacy of a tragedy. January 13, 1908, anticipation filled the air in Boyertown. People were excited to see the play and the Magic Lantern slideshow of Scotland. 
No one imagined any harm could come from what was considered at the time to be a modern marvel. But those in attendance at the sold-out show at the Rhodes Opera House would soon find out just how dangerous the magic lantern could be. Monday, January 13, 1908. Boyertown awoke to a cold, crisp day. Even so, the borough was buzzing about a play later that night at the Rhodes Opera House. I got the sense it's just something you set your calendar for, that this is where you need it to be because it's where everyone would be. 30-year-old Olivia Romig spent the day sobbing at her mother's five and 10 store. She had a ticket for the following night's performance, but wanted desperately to surprise her husband. George Romig was the pianist for St. John's Church and was playing the music for the show. Her niece had a ticket for the first night, and she cried and cried. And the, the niece broke down and said, OK, you can trade, and I'll go the second night. 18-year-old Gwendolyn Mayer also had a ticket for the first night, as did 13-year-old Lulu Fegley. Lulu was going with her cousin, Franklin Lighty, who was the same age. This was her first outing by herself. And little Franklin came and picked her up, and the two of them walked down to the opera house together. The Scottish Reformation was the second play brought to town by celebrated playwright Harriet Monroe. Mrs. Monroe was out of town that night. She was busy setting up other venues in Wilkes-Barre. Her sister Della Mayers and projectionist Harry Fisher spent the day at the Opera House handling last-minute details. The theater was located on the second floor of um, the building, and the stage was located towards the back. Uh, they had installed extra chairs, you know, planning on there being a lot of extra people in the building. Built in 1885 by Thomas J.B. Rhodes, the Opera House was the scene of many performances and graduations. Kerosene footlights illuminated the stage. The auditorium itself did not pose a, a threat in people's minds. They had gone there before and they were very comfortable in the building. However, it was very full that night. By all accounts, 252 people waited eagerly for the curtain to rise. These people were so thrilled to either be a part of the show or people who were excited to be in the audience that night. To the community of Pennsylvania Dutch Protestants, the spectacle of Mary Queen of Scots' historic struggle to reform religion in a distant country was alluring. Mrs. Monroe provided elaborate costumes and sets, while 60 local actors made up the cast. Many were members of St. John's Church, who stood to take home 15% of the profits. They also had set up a stereopticon projector um, to show slides during the uh, intermissions of the play. The stereopticon, or magic lantern, used a combination of hydrogen and oxygen gases to produce calcium light. In 1908, moving pictures were a novelty and had yet to surpass the popular magic lantern slideshows. Just before the third act, the cast was preparing for Queen Mary's dramatic execution scene. The audience watched flickering images of Scotland, unaware they were about to take part in a drama of their own. There was sort of this eeriness, I think, in the audience because of the, you know, where they were in the sequence of the story. Just then, one of the magic lantern gas tubes came loose. Survivors recall hearing a loud hissing noise. It was a very frightening sound. A kerosene lamp was knocked over by people on the stage who were, lo were looking out to find out what was going on. A fire started on stage. Editor Charles Spots and St. John's Reverend Adam Weber tried to put out the flames. They tried to pick up the oil tank and throw it out the window. But in the process, the oil tank spilled and the fire covered them as well. The startled audience watched as the curtain ignited and then a flash of light. It was as if the air caught on fire. The panicked crowd mauled each other trying to escape the flames. 
where they saw her falling and piled up behind the, behind the doors. Eva Leffel's mother was two months pregnant with her when she escaped from the opera house. All she said was that she, they were lucky to get out because if their mother wasn't sick, they would have been in early and they'd have been up front. The only survivor still living, Leffel remembers her mother saying instinct told her to ignore pleadings for the audience to be calm and bolt for the door. A lot of confusion on stage, confusion and, and fear and terror. It had to be terror in the audience um, and everyone just trying to get out all at the same time. Some managed to make it down the back stairs or through one of two fire escapes. Among them, Lynette Holbert's grandmother, Hilda Funk. She later said, very sadly, it was, a, it was something that always haunted her. Why didn't I turn around and say, come this way? but Hilda's pleadings would have likely gone unheard. The screaming mass was crushing toward the door they came in. And then that's when they realized they were trapped. The fire lit up the night sky. A young boy who escaped from the inferno ran several blocks to the fire station. The Apple House is on fire! Members of the Keystone Fire Company assembled within minutes. There was no time to hook up the horses and the hose cart. We'll just have to pull it. Hurry! Pull, man, pull! Faster, faster, hurry! Knowing his sister Lottie was at the play, John Graver grabbed the left corner of the cart. The men would have to pull it to the intersection and then two blocks down the hill on Philadelphia Avenue. The street was recently paved with cobblestones. The firefighters slipped, sending them crashing into a tree a block away. Graver was crushed, the cart destroyed. As he lay dying, Graver urged the others to go fight the fire. The second fire company in town, Friendship Hook and Ladder, had the only other cart to fight the fire. By the time the brigade arrived, the opera house was fully engulfed. The fire really wasn't put under control until about four o'clock in the morning. Uh, and that was after uh, additional help arrived from the Pottstown Fire Department. Boyertown began to realize this was just the beginning of their sorrow. The Rhodes Opera House fire, the legacy of a tragedy. The Opera House fire was the worst disaster Boyertown had ever seen. The entire town rushed to the Opera House, some risking their own lives to save others. Hysterical townspeople stood outside, listening to the horrifying screams of those who were trapped. The tragedy would thrust Boyertown into the national spotlight, and a mystery would take center stage. Boyertown Burgess Daniel Kohler found his son outside the Opera House. His fears as a father were relieved, but as the town's mayor, he had to bring order to the chaos erupting around him. Boyertown only had two policemen, so Kohler called the state constabulary in Reading for help. They arrived by rail an hour and a half later with doctors and nurses. Berks County Coroner Dr. Robert Strasser was on his way from Reading to deal with the unknown number of casualties. I think uh Carner Robert Strasser, who was very young and very new at the job, must have thought, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? You know, this is like the, the worst incident in the history of the coroner's office of Berks County, and, and I better do a good job. As dawn broke Tuesday morning, smoke was still rising from the ashes of the opera house, and icicles hung from its charred shell. The constabulary roped off the building a teary-eyed crowd began to whisper. They're taking him out. Coroner Strasser covered his eyes when he saw the job before him. This would be orderly, thorough. Strasser based his plan on methods to identify the bodies used in the San Francisco earthquake and fire of 1906. He asked people as they brought the bodies out to separate any kind of article of clothing or jewelry uh, that, with which the body could be identified. And each 
body was given a number, and their possessions were given a number. But Strasser had no idea exactly how large and how difficult an undertaking that would be. By noon Tuesday, 45 bodies were wrapped in blankets and lowered from the ruins of the Opera House. The bitter cold was starting to take its toll on the volunteers, who worked under the constant gaze of grieving family members. Workers had just begun to make a dent. They set up designated places to serve as morgues. Um, there were two or three buildings that were in close proximity to the site of the fire that were used. Um, one of those was the school building, one of them was a furniture store. By nightfall, 162 bodies lay in four makeshift moors. Outside the Opera House ruins, dozens of unclaimed carriages stood abandoned. I thought about the horses and restless and they, they knew their owners, and so in many cases the horses could have sensed that no one was going to come and get them. News of the tragedy shocked the nation. Telegrams, letters, and phone calls from frantic family members flooded Boyertown. Many would go unanswered. President Theodore Roosevelt forwarded condolences from across the world. I hear with keen emotion of the tragic accident which occurred at the Boyertown Theater. I beg your excellency to accept my sincere condolence and the expression of my grieving sympathy to the families of the victims. Armand Fallier, President of France. Hundreds of newspaper reporters flooded the town to document the tragedy. Interviews with victims, families, and survivors were read at breakfast tables across the nation. It seemed cruel but Coroner Strasser wouldn't let anyone claim their dead until all of the victims had been recovered and an inquest jury of six men took a look at the bodies. Wednesday morning, hysterical families stood outside the morgues. The constabulary worried a riot might break out. Finally, Strasser opened the doors to the morgues and the search for loved ones began. He allowed only four families to come in at a time to look through the whole list of the people who died so that people would have a chance to search in sort of a dignified, calm way. The families combed through charred clothing and jewelry, hoping to find something that would lead to an identification. 19-year-old Lottie Bauman was one of the first to be claimed. When they went to identify the body, they found... Um, Lottie's handkerchief in, in her purse. It's really a rather distinctive design. As family members waited in line outside the morgues, undertakers discovered what appeared to be a mystery. A woman dressed in men's clothing with a gold pocket watch. A lot of theories were going around about that, that um, she was a woman hiding out for some reason, um, possibly a spy. The newspapers latched onto the story. Yes, and it was blown out of proportion. The woman was also wearing a signet ring with the letter R, a pin and a bracelet. Meanwhile, jewelry found on other bodies disappeared. Strasser ordered the mystery woman's body be kept under guard in another room. This mystery had to be solved. They thought, was she with a gang of thieves that came into town to rob the bank? Because the, the bank was on the first floor. Uh, Farmers National Bank. Uh, all kinds of speculation about her. Miles away in Philadelphia, the Diamond family held services for their 14-year-old daughter Rosa. Her family read about the mystery woman in the papers. Remembering Rosa was wearing a signet ring when she died, a family member rushed back to Boyertown. The woman's identity was no longer a mystery. Somehow, men's clothing was placed next to Rosa's body. The wrong body was sent to, to Philadelphia to be buried, so they had to bring her back. The Rhodes Opera House fire, the legacy of a tragedy. town was grappling with the deaths of 171 people. The youngest was three-year-old Harold Nuss, 
who attended the play that night with his father, Charles, and his mother, Annie, who also perished. In the days that followed, the sound of picks and shovels echoed through the town. It took four days to carve out 107 graves in the frozen ground. The town was overwhelmed by the task, by their grief, and by a flush of spectators. Nearly 10% of Boyertown's population died in the fire. Some had no family to claim them. The Anderson and Nuss families were completely wiped out. The Taggart family's absence went unnoticed until someone discovered their farm was untended and their animals crying out in hunger. Burgess Kohler appointed a relief committee to help bury the dead and volunteers to help dig graves. Early Thursday morning, the digging began. 40 volunteers from the company that paved Boyertown streets were now digging its graves. The men would also have to prepare a common grave for the bodies of the unidentified. The relief committee bought a large lot at Fairview Cemetery and planned to place a memorial on the spot. Down the street, employees at the casket company worked nonstop. I know they had to make a lot of caskets and they made all the caskets for the unidentified. So it must have been a very sad time for them to have to, to be doing that. They lost, I think, four or five workers in the fire. The funerals began Thursday. 124 were buried at Fairview and Union cemeteries. 46 were shipped by rail or carriage to other cemeteries. Local lodges provided pallbearers, and ministers came from other towns to help Good Shepherd Reverend George Greenwald deliver quick graveside services. St. John's Reverend Adam Weber was injured in the fire and left bedridden. He couldn't preside at the 78 funerals of his congregation members or attend the burial of his daughter Martha. And I'm told that at her death, the funeral was held in the parsonage just up the street and, she, uh, and they carried her casket up the steps so that he could lay his hand on it before they carried it to the cemetery. By Friday, the town was flooded with hundreds of visitors. There were a lot of people coming in. A lot of them were curiosity seekers, uh, spectators, but there, there were a lot of people also who came to help. Some dug graves while others walked behind hearses and stood on street corners watching the town grieve. My grandmother always remembered the procession of hearses, the constant procession. You know, she knew all of them. They were all, I mean, everybody knew everyone in this little town. The crush of spectators and reporters was constant. Pickpockets took advantage of the large crowds. A thousand people attended the graveside service for six Moyer cousins of New Berlinville. The Moyers lost eight members of their family. It was a scene played out over and over again. George Romig buried his wife Olivia. Lulu Fegley and Franklin Lighty were laid to rest. Alfred Graver wept at the funeral of his children, John and Lottie. And Irene Mayer said goodbye to her husband Charles and her daughter Gwendolyn. I can't imagine, as a parent, I can't imagine what that must be like. And I would think it would just have to be an emotional breakdown of, of how do you go on? Why my child? The deaths brought the town to a standstill. Among the dead were a policeman, a doctor, a butcher, postal workers, the cemetery sexton, countless business owners and teachers. Yeah.
Guten Morgen. This morning, they carry all of our friends to the cemetery. Sunday, Boyertown held the funeral for the 25 unidentified. The service was divided into two sets. At 9 a.m., the bodies of 13 of the unidentified were carried to Fairview. The same lodge people who had served as pallbearers individually now served as an honor guard at all of the 13 hearses. Wearing suits and white gloves, the pallbearers walked alongside the hearses, passing an estimated crowd of 15,000 people. People are naturally curious. They're going to really want to feel. They want to know as much information as you can possibly find. It was a sight that added to the fears of Boyertown residents. Some of the people were afraid that the streets would collapse because the, the southern part of the town, there's an iron mine. During the service, clergymen uttered the same simple sentence for each victim. Job 120. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It was a very orderly, orderly service, but a very sad service, obviously. An hour and a half later, the hearses and pallbearers headed back to Washington School Morgue to pick up the last 11 bodies. One grave remained open, the woman mistaken for Rosa Diamond. Her body was on its way home. It was a day Berks County Democrat editor Charles Spots was relieved to see come to an end. The scenes of last Sunday were so indescribably sad no words can picture them. Now visitors and strange faces are gone, and we are left to reflect over the great calamity with our own thoughts. The Rhodes Opera House fire, the legacy of a tragedy. questions surrounding the Rhodes Opera House fire, and soon the finger pointing would begin. Where did the fault lie? With a projectionist or the author who hired him? Perhaps the building owner, Thomas J.B. Rhodes. The town wanted someone to answer for the tragedy. The inquest would be thorough and emotional. With their dead buried and the hordes of spectators gone, Boyertown was grappling for answers. Who was to blame? George Romig played the music the night of the fire. A kerosene lamp rested on his piano. He was accused, he felt falsely, uh, of, of being the one who upset this lamp and started the conflagration. Romig clipped newspaper reports of the fire and its aftermath to use in his defense, writing the word false across inaccuracies that pointed the blame in his direction. But the eye of suspicion would overlook Romig. As the inquest jury assembled to hear testimony January 28th in the Friendship Firehouse meeting hall. At the onset, Coroner Strasser was quoted in the Reading Telegram. I do not like to make any prophecies at present, but I will state that I believe, from the information in my hands at the present time, that there will be four arrests. There was testimony. They asked about how the building was built, when the building was built, what the materials were that the building was made of. It's horrible. How many people might have been in the theater that night? And they asked about the exits. Strasser subpoenaed 50 witnesses. You probably could have heard a pin drop when Dr. Rhodes took the stand. Rhodes claimed he wasn't to blame because the building passed inspection in 1904 after fire escapes were installed. Contrary to Rhodes' testimony, factory inspector Harry Bechtel told the jury he warned Rhodes about marking the exits and lowering window sills at the fire escapes. Bechtel admitted he didn't follow up to see if the changes were made. He was, uh, got hot under the collar during all this questioning. 
And he said, I didn't have time to come over to a measly little town like Border Town to do this inspection because I have so many other things to inspect. Bechtel's words sparked an angry outburst in the courtroom. He had to be escorted away from the proceedings by state police. There had been concerns about Harry Fisher, the projectionist, who was new to operating the projector. Harry Fisher also claimed he wasn't at fault. Fisher testified after the hose came off the stereo opticon, he closed the valves. Confirming his words proved to be difficult. Days after the fire, an opportunist stole the tanks to put them on display. The tanks were returned, but because they were tampered with, they were useless in the investigation. Fisher also denied there was an explosion, saying he would have been one of the first ones killed. Fisher claimed people died because they panicked. It was determined that he really had not had much training and was very inexperienced. Fisher had two days training operating the Stereopticon. The company who sold it to Harriet Monroe testified an operator should have at least three months experience. And should the gases be exposed to a flame, an explosion would occur. Inhalation could cause death. With the hydrogen gas escaping and the flames in the air, my theory is that most of them suffocated before they were burned. Mrs. Monroe didn't appear at the inquiry, but a letter she wrote to her former projectionist, Charles R. Sheridan, five days after the fire, was read into evidence. I trust that you will drop no word that would indicate that Fisher was not a thorough operator. Make him known that he was an operator for eight months. Sheridan read a second letter to the jury, this time from Mrs. Monroe's sister, Della Mayers, who died in the fire. Mayers described Fisher's stereopticon skills as incompetent. Ultimately, the jury ruled the blame rested on the shoulders of two people, Harriet Monroe for hiring an inexperienced projectionist and Harry Bechtel for failing to enforce adequate safety measures. The jury recommended both be prosecuted for criminal negligence. But in the end, the district attorney would not file charges because of a lack of evidence. The proceedings probably could have gotten a conviction today, but in 1908, the, the legal tools didn't exist. The jury recommended the state legislature adopt stricter safety precautions for public buildings and license stereopticon and motion picture operators. This couldn't be allowed to happen again. The Rhodes Opera House fire, the legacy of a tragedy. Opera House fire death toll shocked the nation. Lawmakers wanted to find a way to keep something like this from happening again. But there were those who called for changes well before the tragedy. To Philadelphia Fire Marshal John Latimer, the Rhodes Opera House fire was a senseless tragedy. He had proposed in the legislature the year before that fire escapes be marked and that doors open outward, and the legislature did not pass his law. In the spring of 1909, a year after Boyertown's midwinter morning, the Pennsylvania legislature gathered to take action. Two bills passed in May. The first was Act 233. They tried to improve the building codes and the laws governing fires and catastrophes of this type. Especially in theaters, they determined what types of curtains could be used and what type of lighting should be used. Exit signs needed to be installed. One of the most important things was that um, doors on public buildings had to open outward. The act also required auditoriums to have a center aisle and two side aisles. Second floors must have more than one exit, and outside stairway entrances must have a four-foot landing. The act required all exits and fire escapes be easily accessible, kept in good repair and free from obstruction. 
Combustible oil was outlawed as a source of lighting, and fire extinguishers must be placed on stage. Builders of new theaters were required to submit designs to factory inspectors. Failure to do so would result in a $500 fine or six months in jail. Theater owners were now liable for fire deaths. The second bill, Act 206, required booths for picture machines and stereopticons be fireproof. The passage of these reforms were closely watched by legislators across the nation. The state of New York also looked at it as an example for writing some of their state legislature. Soon, other states followed suit. The closed doors of that opera house fire opened the doors and opened the eyes of uh, lawmakers everywhere. By the 1920s, Pennsylvania's laws were national standards. The Rhodes Opera House fire, the legacy of a tragedy. Recovering from the tragedy would be no easy task. Visitors would often remark at the sad expressions and the bowed heads seen on the streets years later. Several family members filed civil suits against Harriet Monroe and Thomas Rhodes and both faced charges, but neither was prosecuted. Instead, the town focused its energy on its children and its future. In the months after the fire, the slow, painful healing process began. I think in Dickens' words, the best of times and the worst of times. And I think especially it was the best of times that it brought out the best of people because this disaster had to be overcome in some way. Overcoming Boyertown's grief meant resuming life in the Pennsylvania Dutch way, leaving memories of the fire unspoken, letting time ease the pain. The large charity of time brings us the human privilege of forgetfulness. If memory were perfect, life would be unendurable. Charles Spots. The memory of what happened would soon fade from the national spotlight. Even so, Boyertown continued to anguish in silence. One family in particular, the, the children remember saying that, that they never really understood why their parents were so nervous when they were in confined spaces like that until they were much older and realized that they had survived the fire. It was as if Boyertown wanted to wipe the pain from its memory. A century later, few outside the borough are aware of what happened at the Rhodes Opera House and its impact on national safety laws. This is the uh the, the record from 1908. Residents searching for clues about how the borough dealt with its loss have difficulty finding information in church records. And it's noticeable and notable by what it doesn't contain. There's almost no note of the fire in the, uh, in the document. There is a meeting that occurred on January 17th, that's just four days after the fire, and the main item of business was to express condolences, uh, but there is no mention of why there are condolences. I guess it was just assumed everybody knew that of the great tragedy. Instead, Boyertown of 1908 focused on its children. 15 were orphaned, 21 lost mothers, 14 were fatherless. Families across the country offered to adopt them. Boyertown graciously declined. The orphans which we will have taken care of, we believe it is better to leave them here in the community where they feel at home, purchased Daniel Kohler. The Relief Committee continued its work, setting up trust funds for 50 children whose parents died in the fire. The Washington schoolhouse was scrubbed and reopened. Three of the teachers who perished were replaced. The following year, enrollment was up 44 students. Abandoned homes and farms were sold at auction. Their new owners painted, planted, and blended with their neighbors. Businesses installed electric lights and brought new customers to town. And the place where their hearts were broken was rebuilt. But there would never be another play inside the Rhodes building. 
just office space, a hardware store, and a bank. Five years later, the State Theater was um, built. People started, maybe like the year before that, to go to an outdoor um, lot and watch moving pictures. Boyertown State Theater was constructed using safety laws born out of the Rhodes Opera House tragedy. It made the community feel a little bit better. And plus it was a one-story building, so that was helpful. Even so, the orphan borough was reluctant to attend the theater. Today, the Rhodes Building has apartments where the Opera House used to be. On the ground floor, a plaque memorializes those lost in the flames of 1908. A real estate office and a fitness center occupy the ground level. They have like the old architecture, it's a solid building. This is the only building in town, the only building in the area that is fire resistant. If you go in the back, you will find an old elevator with Thomas J.B. Rhodes' name still visibly stamped on the beams. The history has to be continued through and people have to understand what happened here. It's a history present-day Boyertown is trying to resuscitate. We want them to know how these people must have felt losing entire families, losing friends, losing relatives. Photographs of the tragedy express Boyertown's loss in exhibits. But I am not to blame. Several plays have been written, and two books, Midwinter Morning and A Town in Tragedy, have chronicled the devastation. Opera House historian and author Mary Jane Snyder Lentz has spent decades telling the story. In recent years, the Boyertown Historical Society has placed the curious in the shoes of the victims. The Remembrance Walk is a self-guided tour of 30 different sites in Boyertown that have some connection with the fire. The desire to remember has summoned dusty picture books from attics and heirlooms from family collections, family trees trying to reconcile a tragedy that tore them from their roots. You can open up the phone book and you can read these names because their descendants are still here in town. And whether they sense it during, you know, their waking hours, it's, it's a part of our reality. Do you think Boyertown has recovered from this fire? On some levels, I don't think so. I think there, between there are still enough people who have some connection, whether it's through a family member or uh, some people that may have been here at the time. I know they will never forget. There is a permanent exhibit on the Rhodes Opera House fire here at the Boyertown Historical Society. It honors the 170 souls lost in the flames, as well as the firefighter, fathers, mothers, and small children. While many across the nation are unaware of how their deaths became a catalyst for stricter fire safety laws, Boyertown will always remember the Rhodes Opera House fire, the legacy of a tragedy.